All right, brilliant. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, for the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance's medical series at the next instalment tonight. We are joined by Matilde Costa Fernandez. Uh, we're very fortunate to hear her talk tonight. Um, and this is a talk about her master's thesis, which was on antimicrobial resistances in loggerhead sea turtles uh, from Cape Verde, from Mayo Island. Um, she also studied the antimicrobial resistant profiles of bacteria isolated from sloths in Costa Rica. And she is currently based in the UK, in Surrey, at a wildlife rescue centre, but has a passion and love for sea turtles, so focused this research on turtles. So without further ado, I'm very glad to introduce you and please take it away, Matilde. Thank you, Claire, for the introduction, and thank you to the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance team for this invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this medical series, and for today's talk, we'll be talking about antimicrobial resistance in sea turtles. We'll be discussing if it is something that we should worry about, what is the current panorama, and for this specific topic, I will be presenting um, my own research study that focuses on antibiotic resistance profiles of loggerhead turtles of the island of Mayo in Cape Verde, and we'll be also discussing briefly about what could be our role in addressing this issue. And to start with this presentation, well, and because we'll be talking a lot about antimicrobial resistance, I believe it is important to describe what it is. And put it simply, antimicrobial resistance happens when a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, or a parasite develop the ability to no longer respond to antimicrobial compounds, which, as we can predict, will make infections by these pathogens harder to treat and can also lead to an increasing risk of disease spread, uh, severe illness, and even death. So what happens is when bacteria are in the presence of an antibiotic, this will exert a selective pressure on this bacterium to develop mechanisms to become resistant to that antibiotic. And there are several mechanisms that bacteria can develop. For example, they can produce enzymes that will destroy the antibacterial agent. They could produce mutations on the target site for that specific antibacterial agent. They can also produce these little weapons called the flux pumps that won't allow an adequate concentration of the antibacterial agent inside the bacterial cell wall by expelling it. And there are several more mechanisms that bacteria can develop. The thing here is that bacteria go a bit further and they not only develop all these mechanisms, but they can share this information with other bacteria. And they can do this um, in a process that is called the horizontal exchange of mobile genetic elements. And what this means is that bacteria can share part of their genome with other bacteria that contains information of how to become resistant to an antibiotic or group of antibiotics. So what happens is that the second bacteria doesn't need to be exposed to the antimicrobial compound to become resistant. And what we can understand from this point is that the dissemination of antimicrobial resistance can happen through the dissemination of antimicrobial compounds, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and also antibiotic resistant genes. So if we look at the sources of AMR, and this is quite important, so antibiotic resistance is something that happens in nature as a natural process of bacteria to protect against naturally occurring antibiotics or heavy metals, but it also happens in medical and agriculture settings. And this could be through the pharmaceutical production of antibiotics, but mostly through the consumption of antibiotics. And here, the main difference between the selection for antibiotic resistance that happens in nature and the one that happens in medical and agricultural breakdowns is the pace at which it happens, which is much faster in the second group. And this is obviously aggravated by the misuse and overuse of antibiotics. So if we consider that one of the main sources of AMR is antimicrobial use, and we want to look at how it's transmitted. So humans and animals play an important role in this. 
and AMR can be transmitted through the food chain, but it can also be introduced into the sewage or manner and finally end up in the environment. Once in the environment, both humans and animals can become infected by antibiotic resistant bacteria if they are exposed to environments that were previously contaminated by or antibiotic resistant bacteria or antibiotic resistant genes. And what we can understand from this graphic is there are several ways of how AMR can be transmitted, uh, but we can also understand how difficult it would be to control the dissemination of AMR, especially once in it ends up in the environment. But what is the current panorama regarding the antimicrobial resistance issue? Unfortunately, antimicrobial resistance is not going to be one of the bigger threats to global health, food safety, and development worldwide. Many scientists refer to it as the silent pandemic because, in fact, antibiotic resistance kills over 1 million people a year, and it also has a huge impact on economies worldwide. And I believe that all this information is quite concerning, but unfortunately, there is still not enough attention given to this issue. And now we'll be looking at how did our sea turtles get involved in a antimicrobial resistant issue. And a key moment for this was in 2009, when 14 collaborators published an article that revealed a concerningly high level of antibiotic resistance in bacteria isolated from loggerhead turtles of the central Mediterranean Sea. And these findings were quite shocking among the scientific community because no one was expecting such high levels of antibiotic resistance in bacteria from sea turtles as one would assume that these animals were protected from antimicrobial contamination. But what the results from this study showed was quite the opposite. And Forti et al. suggested that these high levels of antibiotic resistance uh, reflected the contamination of the Mediterranean Sea by polluted effluents. And they also suggested that these species should be considered a bioindicator to be used for monitoring marine pollution. And after this study by Foderol, several others follow it, which not only confirmed the results by Foderol, but also revealed even more concerning results. Uh, because most of these studies detected resistance towards antimicrobials of significant importance to both human and veterinary medicine, and they also detected multidrug resistant bacteria, which are bacteria that are resistant to uh, three, uh, two antimicrobials of three different categories. And as we can see from this map, most of these studies focused on the subpopulation of the Mediterranean. There are a couple of studies performed in the turtles from the Pacific, a couple in the Southwest Atlantic, but there were no studies addressing the antimicrobial resistant issue in loggerhead uh, sea turtles from the Northeast Atlantic, which is now being considering the largest loggerhead subpopulation worldwide. And this was one of the main reasons why we decided to focus our study in this specific subpopulation. So one thing that all the scientists working with the antimicrobial resistant issue in sea turtles realized from an early stage was that this should be addressed under the One Health view, which uh, recognizes the interconnection between animal health, environmental health, and public health. But the One Health Initiative not only recognizes this interconnection, but also encourages that professionals from these three different areas work together in tackling these type of issues. So how does the antimicrobial resistant, the high levels of antibiotic resistant bacteria can affect sea turtles? So this is by impairing the treatment of infections by these bacteria. And in fact, the recent study by Trotter et al. 
reveal a higher frequency of multi-drug resistant strains from um, samples collected from infected wounds in sea turtles compared with uh, the levels um, detected by um, in samples that were collected with animals with no clinical history. On the environmental health side, and we've already seen this, these high levels of antibiotic resistant bacteria in sea turtles have been associated with the higher pollution of the marine environments. As such, the loggerhead turtles now consider the model species for the evaluation of environmental health. And on the public health side, humans can be affected by a direct or indirect contact with sea turtles that harbor the high levels of antimicrobial resistance. And these can also impair the treatment of infections. And the populations that are at high risk are definitely the ones that unfortunately still consume turtle related products. And now moving on to the presentation of our study. Um, as it was mentioned before, our study focused on antibiotic resistant and viralist profiles of gram negative bacteria, as well as from other head turtles of the island of mine, Cape Verde. Our study is published in Antibiotics, and it was part of a collaboration between the Laboratory of Bacteriology of the Faculty of Trinidad Medicine in Lisbon, Mayo Biodiversity Foundation in the island of Mayo, CISA, and Veterinaries Without Borders Portugal. And to give a bit of background in the superpopulation of our study, so to look at this species, the loggerhead turtle, this species is constituted by 10 superpopulations worldwide, being one of these superpopulations in the Northeast Atlantic. And although the categorization for this species by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature is as vulnerable, this specific subpopulation is categorized, categorized by endangered, as endangered. And part of this classification is due to the fact that all nesting sites are located in the archipelago of Cape Verde, which is considered a small area of occupation. And here we have the archipelago of Cape Verde, and inside the archipelago, the island of Mayo is now considered one of the most important global refugees for the conservation of loggerheads worldwide. So having all this um, information about the antimicrobial resistant issue and the studies that were being performed in other subpopulations, and also looking in to addressing this under the One Health Initiative, in our study, we aim to address two main questions, being the first one, does the loggerhead colony of the island of Mayo harbors the high levels of antibiotic resistance that were detected in other loggerhead colonies, especially the ones from the subpopulation of the Mediterranean? And do the isolated bacterial species may represent a threat to loggerheads' health, as well as the health of the populations that still consume turtle-related products? And the first step of our study was my dislocation to the island of Mayo in Cape Verde in August 2019, where together with Mayo Biodiversity Foundation, we collected 99 samples from 33 animals, including a swab sample from the cloaca, a swab sample from the oral cavity, and one sample from the content. And I won't go into the lab procedures in detail, but if you have any questions, you can contact me and you can also check our paper that has all the lab procedures. But very briefly, after we collected our samples, we produced the isolation of gram-negative bacteria present in these samples, and we use different culture media for this. After we isolated the bacteria, we identify our isolates through biochemical galleries. We, of course, evaluated antibiotic resistance profile through the disk diffusion method, and we also evaluated the violence profiles of these bacteria through phenotypic plate tests. And now looking at what were our results and what conclusions did we got from them, what we detected was that all identified bacterial species in our study were previously associated with 
different seed title diseases, including ulcerative stomatitis, hepatitis, bronchial pneumonia, conjunctivitis. So we suggest that this species could have a potential impact in animal health, but some of these species could also have a potential impact on the reproductive success of the species because they were also previously associated with higher embryonic mortality and unhatched eggs. Through the evaluation of the level of antimicrobial resistance, what we observed was that the higher levels of resistance were detected toward tetracycline, but all our isolates were susceptible to the aminoglycoside class. And here we tested gentamicin, tobramycin, and micacin. However, we detected an intermediate resistance towards inupinem, which um, is, uh, raises concern due to the categorization of carboponems as antimicrobials of last resort for important infections in humans, especially gram-negative infection. However, we detected a lower level of antimicrobial resistance, especially compared with other studies performed in the Mediterranean. And we did something else with our results. With the information that we got from the uh, resist antibiotic resistance profiles, we calculating something that is called the multiple antibiotic resistance index. And this gave us a bit more information about our results. So what we detected was that we had two isolates with MAR indices equal or higher than 0 0.2. And we'll see what this means in the next slide. And how did we interpret our results? So we know that the high levels of AMR and C turtles bacteria have been associated with a high exposure to anthropogenic factors, especially wastewater carrying high levels of antimicrobials or antibiotic resistant bacteria from the aquaculture industry, intensive farms or medical facilities. So we could explain our lower levels of AMR that we detected in our isolate by a lower exposure of our sea turtles to anthropogenic factors. And if we think, in fact, this turtle colony has all its nesting, most of its nesting sites in the island of Mai, which is considered a pristine environment. So this could explain that because th that there's no uh, in aquaculture activity or intensive farms medical in the island of Mayu, these animals wouldn't be exposed to uh, sources of antimicrobial resistance. However, we did detect those isolates with more indices equal or higher than 0 0.2. And what this means is that our animals had previous contact to points of high antimicrobial exposure. And we could explain this by the highly migratory nature of sea turtles. Um, however, the migratory routes for this specific subpopulation don't cover highly anthropogenic areas or, or areas with a lot of anthropogenic activity. So this could also mean that uh, the dissemination of antimicrobial resistance has reached also these marine environment, this type of marine environments. I know that in this talk, we are focused on antibiotic resistance, but I wanted to explain a bit why we also evaluated the virulence profiles of our bacteria. So what type of information that the virulence profile gives us is that uh, if bacteria are able to produce a lot of virulence factors, uh, they, will be, uh, they will have a higher pathogenic potential and what the violence factors give to bacteria is um, ability to evade the host immunological uh, system and also to colonize and destroy the host tissues. And we also calculate the violence index for our isolates. And with both the violence index and the MAR index, we can classify our isolates as no threat, moderate threat, or high threat as potential pathogens. 
And what we observed was that a total of 11 isolates were classified as a threat, high or moderate, for animal or human host, or even both. And what we concluded from our results was that we detected a lower level of AMR for this loggerhead colony, which we believe to be a positive and encouraging result regarding the current panorama of the antimicrobial resistant issue. However, we also detected potentially pathogenic gram negative bacteria, isolates with MAR indices equal or higher than 0.2, and also isolates revealing intermediate resistance to amapnems, which um, can uh, be. Uh, can represent a significant risk to sea turtles' health and conservation, as well as significant threat to public health. And I hope that our study served as an example of what is the current panorama regarding the micro resistant issue and um, how disseminated the micro resistant issue is in our environments. And now we'll be discussing briefly about what could be our role in addressing antimicrobial resistant issue and some future perspectives as well. And a fundamental aspect of our role is the responsible prescription and use of antimicrobials. And to aim as the most responsible antibacterial prescribing, we should be reflecting on some key points, including does the condition necessitate antibacterial treatment? Are there other options available besides antibacterial treatment? Will the potential risk of inducing resistance outweigh the benefit of the treatment? We can also be looking either if the proposed treatment is likely to work against the pathogen involved, and we should also take into consideration any potential risks for public health. But our role also includes the rational antibacterial selection. And here we'll be looking into the individual animal factors, including the species, the, the immune status, any comorbidity or current medication. We, can, we also want to look at the type and severity of infection. I'm a bit biased on this point, but I believe that it's super important that we based our decisions um, on the results from culture and sensitivity testing. The spectrum of activity is super important. We should employ narrow spectrum antibiotics over large spectrum antibiotics wherever possible. We should prescribe our antibiotics on the cascade. And um, it's not only important to choose the right antibacterial agent, but also look in using the appropriate dose, route of administration, frequency and duration of treatment. And to guide us toward the um, responsible uh, antibacterial prescribing, there's several guidelines that we can use. And what these guidelines indicate is that we should prescribe only when necessary. We should reduce prophylaxis. And here, for example, we sh uh, antimicrobials should not substitute a good surgical asepsis and good hygiene practice. We also should consider in offering other options. For example, sometimes we, sh we might use a topical treatment instead of a systemic one uh, if it's possible. And this could also avoid uh, creating more antimicrobial resistances. And to treat effectively here again, using the right route of administration, duration and frequency of treatment and to employ narrow spectrum antibiotics. And the, there's also very useful information. For example, the European Medicines Agency gives us information about what type of antimicrobials we should avoid, we should restrict our use or be cautious and prudent in using them. But um, the challenge here is that most of these guidelines are tailored for our small animal practices or for small uh, farm animals. And as far as I'm concerned, there are no general guidelines for antibacterial prescribing in sea turtles. And I also believe that might be something difficult to implement because there's 
a lot of difference between sea turtle rescues and hospitals regarding the resources available, the sea turtle species that you work with and other, and also what are the clinical cases that you see more. So I believe that the first step here is to design our guidelines adapted to our sea turtle rescue or hospital and um, also adapted to what we have available. And uh, here, um, if we, it, this might uh, look like a small step, but it can have a huge impact in tackling the antimicrobial resistant issue. And even if we don't follow all the standards of those guidelines that are used for small animal practice, it also can have a huge impact. And if we have something that we can reflect on and then evolve from it, it, it will be um, definitely uh, something that uh, it will help to tackle the antimicrobial resistant issue. And I'll look a little bit about what could be used in the future and it's already being tested in the present. There are some alternatives to antibiotic therapy and one that has been used uh, in sea turtles with very good results is bacteriophage therapy. And basically phages are virus that kill bacteria and they are host specific though so they will only target the bacteria that we want to kill. And what we can see from this is that we won't have antibiotics in the sea turtle system that might be inducing resistances. And this also has another benefit. So if we use the bacteriophage therapy, we'll be also preserving the health of the gut microbiota of our sea turtles. And I know that this also can have a positive impact on the success of our treatment as well as the rehabilitation of sea turtles. So this is something that is quite promising. These studies are quite preliminary at the moment, but um, there are a lot of research uh, that is being done at the moment and hopefully we'll be able to implement some of these alternatives in the future. And to recap everything that we've been talking about. So today we were talking about the macro resistant issue in sea turtles. And one question that we were addressing is that if we should worry about it. I don't know if you all agree with me at this point, but I believe that the answer is definitely. And we also looked at who is affected by it. It's just the sea turtles, humans. And I hope that by now we all agree also that everyone and basically everywhere is, can be affected by this problem. So here we are looking into uh, public health, animal health and environmental health. And do we have a role in it? Can we do something to address this issue? And we, I think that the answer is also yes. Uh, and we can tackle this issue through a responsible prescription and use of antimicrobials. We should always monitor the success of the antibacterial therapy and we can do this um, through research or also in our clinics and search for alternatives and research is also very important both for monitoring this issue and also for um, testing new alternatives for to antibacterial therapy. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much Matilde for that wonderful talk. Um, we do have a few questions for you, so thank you very much. Um, I think the first one, you already sort of, sort of touched on it, that um, as a veterinarian, uh, you were doing some obviously work in the field with turtles. Would you be able to touch on like the, how you collected the samples and sort of what it was that, um, how you set up your study uh, in the field? That'd be really useful. Thank yes, uh, yes, absolutely. So um, 
working in the field is very important that we have everything planned beforehand because we don't want to disturb the animals. We don't want to be talking around the animals. So uh, we, we work as a team with My Biodiversity Foundation and we have all the samples prepared, all the information that we wanted to collect from our sea turtles. And then what we've done is we waited for, we worked with female sea turtles. So we waited before they proceeded to their nesting. Uh, and uh, once they were um, laying their eggs, we approached them quietly and we collected a sample from the cloaca. And then we proceeded to collect the, sam the sample from the egg. And finally, we collected the sample from uh, the oral cavity. And this procedure didn't last more than a couple of minutes, it was quite fast because we have everything structured and then we collected some information as um, the metal tag or if they had the pit, we also collected that information and um, the, the curved carapace length and some information regarding that animal, if there were any lesions, any obvious lesions or anything uh, any concerning uh, anything that might give us an information that there was like there was some um, this, some type of disease or some clinical problem um, and we we could collect uh, quite a uh, we could collect around 30 samples a night and then we store them um, at four degrees and then we they they were transferred to the lab after we collected the 99 samples so it was uh, quite a quick procedure. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and what would your advice be for someone that wanted to replicate your study uh, in other areas or other species? And what were the main lessons that you learned from your project? Those two questions. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. No, that's a good question. Um, I feel like it again, it's having everything prepared beforehand and also knowing your turtles. I feel like I wished I had the opportunity to work with the turtles before, just uh, working with the people that in the island and monitoring the turtles and for a couple of weeks before starting collecting the samples, because then you know. Uh, the type of animal that you are working with, you know, the team, and then you can also uh, target some of some things that might be problematic that you might need to deal with, and then you can prevent uh, a lot of things if we have that preparation and um, and doing a lot of research, of course, before like knowing what is going on in other places. So you already know what works or not work. So you you want to read as much articles as possible and see what they've done in terms of uh, materials and, and methods, how they store the samples. Um, and they, also, they all can also, if you can contact other uh, people working with sea turtles and ask them for advice, uh, maybe I would have more done more of that before um, starting the my my study definitely <laughs> so i hope that this is a good advice and not <laughs> very vague <laughs> no no it's really useful uh, thank you um and how do you think stra can help with sort of sharing this antibiotic use and resistance um like across rest centers in the world so do you think it's like how how can we be useful to sort of spread your message and find out more about what's happening in other places in the world yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I think that you, what you're doing is already super useful, is bringing rescues and people working with sea turtles together so uh, everyone can help each other in addressing uh, the antimicrobial resistant issues. So maybe uh, an hospital uh, has already a guideline in place that can share with other hospital or even like some uh, antibiotic uh, there's a rescue that already ha had some problems with resistance to a specific antibiotic and now is having very good results with other type of antibiotics. It might be a very useful information and uh, Sra giving this platform for people sharing that type of information. I, I, I believe that is absolutely brilliant and, uh, and I, yeah, it's just communication, communicating with uh, communication among all the people working with sea turtles can be very, very powerful. Thank you, that's really, really great for you to say so. 
Um, and yeah, I do encourage any um, any West centres and hospitals that are members of STRA or would like to join us, um, if that's something that you already do have in place. And and obviously, like we said, regionally, it's quite different about what which, which antibiotics are used, even in turtle medicine and turtle rehabilitation rescue. So uh, if we can share guidelines and sort of share this information, then that would be really, really important. Um, so we would really like to hear from you. And um, as you can see, your, your email is there. So if anyone wants to get in touch um, and do similar projects, then obviously, you know, to get in touch with absolutely. you would be brilliant. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think they, they were the main questions that we had. Um, you have a little bit of time if, if you have anything else that you sort of wanted to add or, or like just said to us, to our members or, yeah. yeah Maybe no, what, about, what about getting as a veterinarian? I think it's very interesting, you know, um, doing veterinary and research. So what was your drivers for sort of starting the project? Yes, no, absolutely. I feel like um, it was quite enlightening to do both because then you can be... Uh, you can have a bit of compassion for people that work in the lab and people that work in the field or who work in the hospital with animals and understand both works because I feel like at least in um, other hospitals like there's not people don't know what other uh, what other professionals do and there's quite a big gap between people that are working just in the lab and people that are working mm -hmm. uh, with directly with the animals and I think that being in both I saw a bit of what are the struggles mm -hmm. and how they could be almost eliminated if people communicate with each other. So I feel like that was very interesting. And also being a veterinary, you can, for example, I had the opportunity to do a necropsy in a sea turtle and do other type of work. So I think like if you have that uh, knowledge, you'll mm -hmm. look at your samples and your results differently as well. So I believe that is very important that we work uh, with, have this type of collaborations because with my biodiversity foundation, I work mainly with biologists and people working in conservation. And then when I was doing the work at my university, I was working with vets. And I feel like having all the knowledge that uh, the people from my university ha had about how these turtles behave, uh, what is their reproductive behavior, and what they, what are, is their diet and everything that we, we don't have. Uh, no one explained in vet school what, these things. Um, yeah. And then um, apply the clinical knowledge to that. I, I feel like I, I interpreted my results in a more like holistic way and so, mm -hmm more things that I wouldn't have opportunity to maybe detect from my results if I didn't have that opportunity to work with different people in different areas. I think that's a really wonderful point, yeah, to make the most of the expertise of the research Absolutely. In the field, scientists and vets, and we can all collaborate and work well together, and I think that's a really important message. Absolutely, no, I absolutely agree, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really thank interesting. You. And um, yeah, like I said, if anyone wants to get in touch, please do email Matilda or message Stra and we will put, us, put you both in touch. And yeah, I think we should definitely be very aware of this sort of emerging and quite serious um, threat. And I think we can all, again, work collaboratively to sort of make sure that we're all working towards the same, the same goal. So thank you very much for your time. It was wonderful thank to hear you. From you. Thank you, Claire. Okay. Thank you. And, um, and please stay uh, in touch, stay tuned, because next month we have our next guest speaker for the next uh, installment of the medical series. Um, and we will also be sharing our SharePoint uh, Microsoft Teams to members uh, at the end of this month. So lots of happening on Stras platform. So yeah, we're really looking forward to this year. So thank you very much. And um, thank you again, Matilda. And see thank you all you. soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>